Hello and welcome to another lecture. Okay, today we're going to go over this cerebral uh, vascular questions and answers. And I hope you study all of this and that you are ready for my questions. Okay, let me give you some advice when it comes to answering all of this. Uh, number one, read your questions. Okay, go over the questions slowly and um, find uh, the distractors. Okay. Because in a good question, you always have those items that they're too similar. They're too similar. And then you say, hey, what's the answer? Hey, identify the good distractors. Sometimes you have to use the process of elimination to find the answer. That one is a good one. But, you know, try it all the time to read the question and answer the question in yourself before taking a look to the uh, options that you have. So then take a look to the options and then you say, hey, look, I found it, it's right there. That's the answer. If that's not the case, it's because you have a double thinking question that you need another additional resource, you need another additional resource in order to answer this. And of course, that additional resource, you gain it when you study more. Also, remember that in order to have your proper answers you have to you have to study you have to understand this and you have to practice with those questions and answers until you make this a type of reflex you, know, you have to make this a type of reflex like a kung fu fighter you know uh, someone throws a punch at the kung fu fighters and he or she knows automatically what to do and that's what you're looking for in here and this is the something that you obtain over and over when you're practicing over and over okay um, remember you're gonna have access to the uh, vascular study plan that includes this 300 questions and answers with hints and explanations test that I have designed for the students studying for their certification test and those questions that you're gonna see uh, right now they are included on that test of course we have more questions and uh, and uh, you know study and, and and I'm just gonna help you to understand this and then you're gonna you're gonna uh, do a great job when you start working with my uh, my exam okay let's move forward and this is the first question that we have which percentage of blood is supplied to the brain by the posterior circulation which percentage of blood is supplied to the brain by the posterior circulation I just gonna give you a few seconds All right, read, read your question. We we're talking about the posterior circulation. Remember, we have an anterior circulation as well. And I hope your answer was B, because the anterior circulation is going to provide to the brain 75%, but the posterior circulation approximately 25%. And remember, the posterior circulation is formed by the vertebral arteries. All right, perfect. Let's move to the next one. This is going to be fun. Okay, which is the most likely explanation for this angiographic image? And let's take a look at this image here. This is the aortic arch. We have the brachiocephalic trunk. And there is something that is not frequent. It's something that we don't see in the, uh, you know, most, most common anatomy. And let's take a look to the options, all right? So it's a common normal variant of the aortic arch. Congenital malformation, is this an artifact? Or is it a previous surgical repair of the aortic arch? Let's take a look. And I hope your answer was A, this is a common normal variant of the aortic arch. This is what we call a bovine arch. Good job, nice, we're going good, we're going good. So. That's the answer, perfect. 
All right, let's keep going. Let's see how it goes. This one is a squid statement best described the maneuver being performed to obtain the spectral waveform on this image. So let's take a look at the image slowly, right? Take a look at this. See, this is the right uh, external carotid. And then uh, we have this undulations in the waveform that they show up when you do the temporal tapping. Let's see the uh, options in here. This waveform is the result of a temporal tap and is always specific to the external carotid. Mm, sounds a little bit good. This waveform is the result of a groove transmitted from the vocal cords to the ECA. This waveform is the result of a maneuver that may have effect over the ICA. Sounds good. This waveform is common and, and normal for this artery regarding if any maneuver is being performed. Now let's take a look at the options one more time. I'm just going to give you a few seconds. And I hope your answer was C. Because remember what I said on my lecture, this waveform it's not 100% specific or sensitive for the external carotid artery. If you tap in the superficial temporal artery, sometimes you're going to see those undulations also um, in the uh, internal carotid artery. Okay, so it's not 100% specific or sensitive for the external carotid artery. Good job. And look at this. This one is a good example of, of, of two good distractors in a question. And sometimes you have more than two good distractors. Maybe all of them are good distractors. So that's why you have to be pretty sure. And how do you get all this, uh, uh, you know, the this ability to answer? And it's just like when you study more and more, okay? That's the, and when you practice questions and answers, okay? All right, let's keep going to the next. Which vessel is most likely to show this spectral waveform with velocities around 100 centimeters per second in normal conditions? And take a look at the waveform. This is a load resistance waveform. And you know because the uh, pixistolic velocity is not so far away from the diastolic velocity, that means your wave has a low pulsatility index and is going to an organ which is constantly asking for flow. Also, the acceleration time is, is short, and the peak is not so sharp. Um, it's like kind of more, a little bit more rounded, okay? This is a load resistance waveform. Let's take a look at this. Now, I'll give you a few seconds for you to answer. And I hope your answer was the internal carotid artery at this time. Vertebral could be a good option if I change my velocity range from 40 to 50 centimeters per second because the vertebral artery has a similar waveform compared to the internal carotid. Okay, both are low resistance. Yeah, we're going good. We're going good. We're having fun in here. Okay, let's move to the next one. Is which uh, hemodynamic mechanism? Most likely explain the blue color found close to the carotid bifurcation according to this image. And uh, this is the carotid bulb, right? And we have this flow layer separation. If you remember, we have this. We have the all those layers going this way. The layers in the center, they will continue straight. But then you have this layers close to the wall that they will do this. So the flow separates, and that's why we call this flow layer separation. But that has another name. I'm just going to give you a few seconds, and let's see how it goes. And I hope your answer was A, is the helical flow. Good job. Nice. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Okay. Uh, which vessel is this arrow pointing to? A vertebral artery, B posterior cerebellar artery, C basal or artery, D posterior communicating artery. Okay, this one, uh, I'm just going to give you a clue here. 
So you're using a transforaminal, transoccipital, or suboccipital window. It's going to give you a few seconds. All right, and I hope your answer was the basilar one. This is one vertebral, this is another vertebral in here, and both are joining together to give you the basilar one. Remember, this is the posterior circulation. Remember circle of Willis? Yes, you do. Perfect. Let's keep going this way, and this says, which other has been sampled according to this image? And that's classic. I'm just going to give you one clue. You're using your transtemporal, not transtemporal, not transtemporal, you're using transorbital, transorbital window, transorbital window through the eye. This is the eyeball here. Sometimes you have to be careful because this waveform right here, it looks pretty similar to that from the middle cerebral artery and you can get confused. All right, like, hey, this is a transtemporal window. No, that's the transorbital one. It's going to be a few seconds. And if you're going through the transorbital, you're, uh, you're taking a look to ophthalmic artery. Perfect. That's the answer. Good job. So, uh, and remember this one, if you see this flow away from the probe, away from the probe, that's because flow is just returning to the internal parotid artery, to the area of the siphon. And maybe it's because we have this external to internal collateralization. Remember that one? Yes, you do. Perfect. Let's keep going to the next question here. Which artery is part of the circle of Willis? Hmm. Let's take a look to the options. Interior cerebral artery segment A2. Is it part of a circle? Remember the circle. Hmm. B. Posterior cerebral artery segment P1. Hmm. C, middle cerebral artery, D, basilar artery. I'm just going to give you a few seconds for you to remember this anatomy. Remember, your visual memory is important. When That's, that's the key for anatomy. And I hope your answer was B. If you remember the arteries forming the circle of Willis, we have anterior communicating artery, anterior cerebral artery segment A1, terminal ICA, right? Posterior communicating arteries in posterior cerebral artery segment P1, all right? So let's repeat this one more time. Anterior communicating artery with anterior cerebral artery segment a1 we have terminal ICA posterior communicating arteries and posterior cerebral arteries segment P1 all right good perfect we're going good good which artery is most likely to demonstrate a low resistance waveform remember low resistance means more flow okay so this artery has to go to something that is asking for this blood External carotid, hmm. vertebral with distal disease present, middle cerebral, and subclavian. I'm going to give you a few seconds here. And of course, that's the middle cerebral. Oral arteries in the circle of Willis are going to give you a low resistance waveform. Beautiful. That's the middle cerebral. Good job. Nice. We keep going this way. Which sign symptom is most likely present when the posterior cerebral circulation is insufficient? We're talking about vertebral basilar insufficiency. Let's go one by one. Aphasia, inability to talk. Speech center is affected. Amurosis fugax. Temporary blindness of one eye. Ataxia, which is loss of coordination of some movements. Unilateral paresthesia. 
So posterior circulation has to do more with the balance, uh, movements, and, and coordination, and all of that. I'm just going to give you a few seconds. And I hope your answer was at this time C, right, which is ataxia. It has to do with a problem in the posterior circulation. Beautiful. Good job. Good job. Nice. Aphasia, amaurosis fugax, and unilateral paresthesia. Those are signs and symptoms related to the anterior circulation. We could go into this way. Which sign symptom is considered non-localizing? Hemiparesis, aphasia, vertigo, and dizziness. It's going to be a few seconds for you to answer. And I hope your answer was uh, dizziness at this time. D, perfect. So hemiparesis is, is related to the anterior circulation. Aphasia is related to the anterior circulation. And vertigo is related to the posterior circulation. Remember dizziness with um, um, headaches, right? Uh, confusion as well. Uh, syncope. All of these are non-localizing symptoms, signs and symptoms. Good job. Nice. We're going good. So let's keep going this way. Which disease presentation produces neurological damage for less than 24 hours? Remember what I said before. When there is a problem um, of, this, uh, of this type, time is critical. And time is the one that is going to give you the classification for the disease. A. Basospasm. Transient ischemic attack for B. C, cerebrovascular accident, D, reversible ischemic neurological deficit. Remember, less than 24 hours, patient is going to recover 100%, but it doesn't mean that there won't be another problem in the future. And I hope your answer at this time was a transient ischemic attack. Perfect. The other one could be the reversible ischemic neurological deficit, but that one takes more than 24 hours to recover to, um, to 100% of the capabilities of the patient. Good, good. We're going perfect. Let's put some energy in this. Which artery is most likely affected in a patient who presents with right hemiparesis, right side of the body, this one right here, this one, this one is affected, aphasia, inability to talk. So the speech center, which is usually on the left side of the brain, if you're right-handed, is affected. And behavioral changes. Right um, middle cerebral, left middle cerebral, right anterior cerebral, left anterior communicating artery. Let's see how it goes. It's going to give you a few seconds this time. All right, and I hope your answer was the left middle cerebral artery. Perfect, that's the one. Okay, because remember, the speech center is the one that is affected, plus the patient has signs and symptoms on the right side of the body. That means that something in the left has been uh, affected right here, and that was the left middle cerebral artery. Perfect, beautiful. So let's keep going this way. So which is the most likely morphologic classification for this plaque according to this to the sonographic image right here? Let's take a look at the plaque in there. I mean, it looks uh, very homogeneous for me. It doesn't have posterior just to shadow in. It's not so complex. Um, it doesn't have like um, many uh, shades of gray, different shades of gray in there. So let's take a look at your options. A, calcific. B, Ulceration, C, fatty streaks, D, fibros. I'm just going to give you a few seconds. And I hope your answer was this is a fibrous soft plaque. All right, that's the one. D, D, perfect. Let's keep going. We got more. We got more. Which frequency is most likely used to evaluate the anterior cerebral artery through a transtemporal window? 
It's like asking which is the frequency that you use for transcranial. A 10 megahertz, B 2 megahertz, C 20 kilohertz, D 7 megahertz. And remember, we are talking about megahertz because we're talking about TCDI, transcranial Doppler imaging. We have a combination of B mode and Doppler here. Remember the principle that you need to penetrate. And for penetration, you need what? It's going to give you a few seconds if you want to penetrate more and being subject to less attenuation. Then you need low frequency, so your answer has to be B. Good job. Let's keep going this way. Which angle of incident is used, uh, used during a TCDI study right here? A, 60 degrees, B, 90 degrees, C, 45 degrees, D, 0 degree. It's going to be a few seconds as well. And uh, it has to be zero degrees parallel to the flow. Beautiful. Good job. For the internal carotid and for the carotid system, we use the 60 degrees angulation. Nice. Which tighter is found at a depth of 55 to 65 millimeters showing by directional flow through a transtemporal window? I think you have all data in there to answer this question. Middle cerebral, terminal, uh, internal, carotid, anterior communicating, or posterior communicating segment P2. I, uh, the key is going to be in bi directional flow, and I'm just going to give you a few seconds for you to answer this. And I hope your answer was B, terminal internal carotid. Remember, it gives you as a branch, the middle cerebral, and another branch is the anterior cerebral. The middle cerebral is moving towards the transducer. The anterior cerebral is going away from the transducer. When you place your sample volume in internal carotid, it's going to give you this bidirectional flow. Perfect. That's the terminal internal carotid. That's the answer. Good job. And let's keep going this way. Which hemispheric ratio index is most likely to be expected based on this TCDI image? Let's take a look at this TCDI image. What do you see in there? That's the middle cerebral artery, okay? Wow. Velocities are high here. So velocities are high. And remember when you have over 120 centimeters per second in the middle cerebral artery, of course, you have to combine all this data with the clinical presentation of the patient and the clinical history. Say the patient um, had a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and you're thinking about what base was passing. You don't diagnose this with only one study. You have to do a serial number of studies during the day in order to determine if your patient has base was passing. And we're talking about this ratio of more than, it's gonna give you a clue here, either B or, or D. And it's more than 3.0, more than three, perfect. Good job, we're going good, we're going good, all right? Let's keep going this way, and that's more than three, perfect. Which maneuver was most likely performed to go from the spectral waveform in the left to the one in the right? Okay, I'm just going to tell you this is a Clamian and Still syndrome. A is the, um, what we call the preasteal or bunny waveform. And the other one, this picture in here, this picture in here is the incomplete steel. Let's go. One by one, a elevation of the arm for more than one minute. Intense exercise of a contralateral arm. Inflation of a cuff over the systolic pressure in the ipsilateral arm, then rapid deflation. And the arm independent position until rubber, rubber is developed. I'm just going to give you a few seconds. This one is a good one, all right?
And I hope your answer will see at this time. Remember, this is one pre still this is one incomplete still. If you place a cuff in the patient's arm and you start inflating this, all right, and then over the systolic pressure, and then um, you skip it in there for three minutes, all right, you know, the arm is just going to lack of this blood that it needs. That when you wrap it deflate, this cough, this muscles in here, they're going to be asking for all that flow, which is going to be stolen from the posterior circulation. And then you're going to have this rapid deacceleration and systole, even more pronounced than this one right here. The subclavian is still syndrome. We talked about this one before. And it was a nice, I think, in my opinion, it was a nice lecture because, um, you know, I, will, I went over you know, all details about subclavian still syndrome. So, um, yes, let's keep going this way, and I hope your answer will see. All right, cool. Uh, which is your sound diagnosis in an eon patient with a neck groove based on this image? So, neck groove or a thrill is palpable, and I'm just going to tell you more. The eon patient had a motorcycle accident right now. I look at that sign in there. That's what we call a double channel sign. Aneurysm, vessel rupture, dissection, or arteriovenous fistula. What do you think? I'm just going to give you a few seconds. And uh, I hope your answer was a dissection. The intima has been detached from the... Uh, media perfect and this is what we have for questions and answers of course we have more we have more in our uh, study plan in our uh, 300 uh, questions exam that I have to sign in order to get ready for this um, um, that vascular exam you're gonna love that you're gonna love that study plan all right so um, keep in touch with us uh, at our, you know, take a look to our website, and um, and yes, look at this. The capacity to learn is a gift. The ability to learn is a skill. The willingness to learn is a choice. So, thank you for making it today, and I'll see you in our next lectures. Okay, next lecture we will continue with more. Have a good day and keep studying and keep learning. Have a good one.